the world famous Las Vegas Strip is flying high again. We give you as many sights and tastes as we possibly can. And we have another great Chardonnay and its winery is pretty spectacular too. In the kitchen we show you how to make the undercover jet setter fennel martini. And we tell you why the Euro US Cup is better than the Ryder Cup and how you can plan one too. Hi everyone. Cheers. We are on the world famous Las Vegas Strip. We are at Giada de Laurentiis' restaurant, Giada's, in the Cromwell Hotel. You've got to check it out. It's fabulous. And the Las Vegas Strip is actually bouncing back. It got hit really bad in the last decade because of the recession, but it is flying high. And one of the newest additions to the Strip is flying high. It's the Link High Roller. It's called the world's largest observation wheel and is well worth your time to take a whirl above Las Vegas. Yeah, and there are 28 pods. It takes about 30 minutes for one trip around. We did it and it was a blast. You can see the entire Las Vegas Valley. You understand how Las Vegas is actually in a bowl surrounded by mountains on all sides. Yeah, and it easily fits about 10 people, but if you have less, you'll just meet other folks on the trip and the atmosphere is super fun and friendly. What is also cool about the high roller is the in-cabin accommodations. In many of them, you have your own bartender who serves some creative high-end drinks. Every five cabins of the 28 cabins has a bar and you can carry your drink with you when you get off. Now, we went during the day. This is the best time to bring kids. It's also cheaper. Prices go up after 6 p.m. Happy hour is late afternoon and early evening. It's usually more crowded and better suited for adults. Either way, enjoy the ride. And speaking of getting around, getting around Vegas is easy. Uber and Lyft are there, but they have also made the cab services there even better. So don't be afraid to forego the rental car if you stay on the strip. And no matter if you're in a cab, a Lyft, or an Uber, always ask your local drivers to share their favorite ideas on restaurants and local places. You may get some great tips that you might not otherwise be aware of. And of course you can walk too. There are so many places to stay on the Strip, too many for us to chronicle here. You can almost always find a room here and of course places to gamble in whatever area tickles your fancy. Jet Setter Deals will have them all for you. But we also want to talk about dining on the Strip. It has become one of the world's great culinary towns. That is so true, and the reason why is simple. All the great chefs are here. We are eating now at Giada's. This is at the Cromwell. Now, if you haven't been to Vegas in a few years, this is where the old Barbary Coast used to be, at the corner of the Strip and Flamingo. Just sitting at the bar was a delight. Her staff goes out of their way to make sure your experience is phenomenal. We had a couple of bartenders who were super excited about creating new and interesting drinks right on the spot for us. Yeah, they were. They, that we gave them our favorite ingredients and they came up with two delicious cocktails for us. They nailed our flavor profiles with the ingredients we gave them. Now, needless to say, there is also a great wine list here too. And Giada uses her Italian touch to give you some new twists. Even the appetizers were creative. This was a delightful focaccia souffle with olive oil and some amazingly creative toppings to create a fun mix and match experience for you. Fried crispy capers, lemon infused mascarpone, and basil pesto were among our favorites. Mm, yeah, and of course we had a burrata cheese, a staple of your diet with Cabernet salt, caper pesto, and lemon zest. Well, of course it is. If we see burrata, we have to have it. <laughs> and how about the chicken masala meatballs with roasted wild mushrooms? Wow. We also had the tasting menu there that comes with a, a beautiful gift of some of Giada's recipes. And we're going to have more details on that in future episodes. Another great chef who parks his cuisine in Vegas is Gordon Ramsay. We hit his steakhouse in the Paris just a few resorts down. And like Giada, he has a creative staff that is there to come up with something unique to make your experience memorable. For instance, these drinks are the concoctions of their bartenders who work right there. This one is called Farm to Shaker, and it used house rosemary infused Bombay gin and a house grapefruit bitters topped with champagne 
Maine. They all have fresh spices, herbs, and fruit-infused liquors that are all made right in-house. This one combines whiskey and wine. Talk about thinking out of the box. And then to the food. This French onion soup was one of the best I think we've ever had. I would get this again and again. And of course, you have to make sure a Brit knows how to make the always difficult beef wellington. <laughs> well, and this was, of course, it's Gordon Ramsay perfectly done. The beef was medium rare, while the pastry was flaky and delicious. Well, next, we stayed at the Paris to enjoy another one of our favorites, Mon Ami Gabi. You can sit inside and feel like you are in a bistro in Paris. It really has that ambiance. Or you can sit outside on the Champs de Strip, as we like to call it, a wonderfully <laughs> pleasant way to spend the afternoon. <laughs> That's correct. And they have their own wines produced and labeled for them by well-known winemakers. All were very good. We were enamored, though, with this Pinot Noir. And the staff there is also very knowledgeable on pairing the wines. The warm goat cheese with fresh tomato sauce was divine. With the garlicky basil toasted baguette you can see here and the cheese and the bread, sacre bleu. Now, when in Paris, you do as the Parisians do. We took the traditional way. We had this escargot. As I would say, it was escargot. It was buttery and perfectly spiced. You died and went to French heaven, that is for sure. The food there is luxe and luscious. But wherever your destination on the strip takes you, one thing is for sure, you can't go hungry in Las Vegas. If you're heading to Vegas, check out Jet Setter Deals. They'll help you with everything you need, and Vegas is way more than just on the strip stuff. There's tons to do off the strip as well, which we will explore for you in later episodes. But when we come back, we're going to take a look at another great Chardonnay, and this one has a great winery to visit as well. And welcome back everybody, cheers. We have another great Chardonnay to show you. But first we are going to show you the winery that makes it. There are many beautiful wineries in Napa and Sonoma. This might be the most elegant. It's Ferrari Carano. Yeah, the grounds are spectacular and we guarantee you will not be bored. Take a stroll outdoors and the grounds are divine. The gardens are we're seeing year round. Yeah, they actually have a tulip hotline for late winter and early spring to find out when the tulips will be in bloom. You can get tours and wine tastings. Your best bet is to call ahead because it is based on availability. Here's the number. And if you're out of the country, go to this site. You can fill in your requests much easier. You know, this place, when you, when you look at it, it has kind of an Italian and a French feel, wouldn't you say? Oh, most definitely. It is a combination of a Tuscan villa in the south of France. And we ended up in the Enetica Reserve Wine Tasting Bar. Now, this is underground, and it's for reserve wines. We tasted a couple of their Chardonnays, and this is truly reserve stuff. Now, there, there's something about this wine. I, I really enjoyed this wine. I know you did, and it wasn't as oaky, I would say. And, of course, I, one of the things about Ferrari Carano is they've got great reds as well. And I had a delightful Sangiovese. It was so beautiful. Now, whatever grape you like, a visit to Ferrari Carano will satisfy your palate. Okay, so let's delve into this wine that we love so much. And you can get it anywhere. And this one, I, you know, I, I think I would put it in my top three, definitely in my top five. Mm -hmm. And this is one that uh, I got introduced to maybe about 10, 15 years ago and uh, uh, just love it. It's, 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 it's oaky and buttery, but it's not... It's, it's a little lighter than some of the others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. It's got a little more citrus, a little more kind of apple, I would say even pear in it, um, right off the top. And then, you know, the bouquet, when you smell it, you can smell that it's not this, it's <coughs> more, it's more of the fruity flavors mm -hmm. and, the, and the lemon kind of flavors, yeah. less of the oaky vanilla. But then on your palate, you get that, that oak and vanilla. Yeah. Well, on the Carano family, they're of Italian descent, so you get a little bit of a feel of, of, a, of a lighter Italian wine. Absolutely, like a Pinot Gris or a Pinot Grigio, yeah. something like that, definitely. Yeah, and then you were introduced to this wine at a Ferrari Carano wine party, correct? Yeah, actually the uh, Carano family, the son, Glenn Carano, and if you're a football fan, you go back to the 1970s, Glenn was a backup quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys for six years, I think he played with the Steelers too. 
Um, didn't have what you would call a big career, but he actually he played in a lot of games and was, was the backup for the Cowboys. And he's running one of the casinos that the family owns up in Reno. I was at a celebrity golf event. And again, another John O'Hurley story. We mentioned John O'Hurley before. John's my, my buddy from, from high school, college, and, and hometown Seinfeld fame. And uh, we're playing in this uh, event, and of course for the celebrities, they had, you know, just free pouring wine. Well, three days of drinking Ferrari Carano. I mean, oh my gosh. So You could do worse. <laughs> you could do a lot worse. And I'm trying to think if that is my first time that I had it, which would have been the late 1990s. But I'm thinking I had it before because I think I knew about it. And not only that, they've got some great reds up there as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they've got a great Pinot, a great Zin, a great Cab. They, they do wonderful wines. Um, you know, it's funny. I can't actually remember when I had my first Ferrari Corano, but I just feel like it's always been in my life. Like, I feel like I've always had it. It's always been delicious, consistently great. And it's another great Chardonnay with food. You, you know, you can really pair it with anything because it's got the good acidity. And, you know, again, when you have a great Chardonnay that's made well, it's full bodied, it's complex. They actually source their grapes from Alexander Valley, Dry Creek Valley, Russian River Valley, and Carneros, which is a very complex blend to put together. So they, they're doing something right, for sure. Well, and you understand the complexity of the taste. And Ferrari Crano, I have to hand it to them. They were one of the first innovators to do the screw top. Another great invention that actually prevents the wine from being corked. Now, a lot of people have gone against this for a long time, but now more and more and more wineries, even French wineries, Absolutely. are using it, Australia being one of the first innovators to also use it, and it actually is a, an aid in preventing the wine from being corked because when you use the cork, not only is it using up the cork around the world, which is a natural resource, but at the same time, it, it is sometimes, if the wine isn't stored or packaged right or kept the correct temperature, all of that, you open a great bottle of wine that you might have had a lot for and it had a cork in it and if it's gone sour or it's vinegar it's been corked and that is something that ruins wine many many times so not only is it easy to open but it's also it's it's a protection for the wine that many people are discovering now and finally coming around and we've had that happen to us before we've actually had a bottle of wine we had to send back oh absolutely of, of the other thing that's great about it is if for some reason you're just going to have a glass and you're gonna hold on to the bottle and have a glass the next day, the screw top is great because you just pop it back in the refrigerator. And yeah. you don't have to worry about sometimes the cork laying it on the side, it's gonna dribble out. And the cork also has more chance of oxygenation getting into that wine and, and tainting the flavor. Again, you have the, the screw top, it's gonna screw on as tight as possible. That is gonna prevent oxidization of the wine. So you have a nice wine the next day to sip and, and enjoy with your food. Now, speaking of, about food, I know we touched on it before. <clears throat> I would not, I mean, I could have this with, with a steak. Mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, pork would be good. Pork is a nice accompaniment to it. Um, you know, cheeses, obviously fish, chicken is great with this. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily really do it with a steak. I mean, unless you had like a Brazilian steak with a, some kind of spicy chimichurri sauce, I think it would hold up to that, yeah. where you're dealing with those flavors. But just a regular steak, I, I wouldn't do it. And when we come back, we're going to give you our undercover jet setter recipe for a fennel vodka martini. It's the perfect thing to drown the sorrows of the poor team that lost in the Euro US Cup. And welcome back. We are going back to the kitchen for another great cocktail recipe. And it's super easy, too. Well, cheers, everyone, and uh, welcome back. Cheers. Oh, wow. That is really, that is really good. We're talking about a fennel vodka martini, and I got to admit, you made this, this is the first time I had that, and that is, that's incredible, the earthiness of the fennel that you get that licorice to. That's a good, good martini. Yeah, no, well that's exactly why I love it. It's it's really a palate opener for before you eat a meal, and it's like an aperitif. That's basically what an aperitif is, is a palate opener, preparing your palate for the meal ahead. And this is a great drink for that. Um, we'll show you how I made it, but I basically started by 
creating the vodka, which is fennel infused vodka. And that started about seven days ago. Uh, you could do it for longer, but seven days is the minimum you wanna do it for. So basically all I did was I chopped up a bunch of fennel and fennel fronds. Um, I put them with two cups of vodka. I used Tito's vodka for this, but you can use any vodka of your choice. And then I sealed it up and I put it in the fridge to sit for seven days. After that, the vodka and the, and the fennel got all friendly and happy together. <laughs> and they became fast friends and they've produced this amazing flavor combination now, which is the licorice from the fennel, which I love, and a little bitter from the Angostura bitters. It's super easy to make. So all you're gonna do is you take a cocktail shaker, fill it with some ice, and then you're gonna get two beautiful glasses because it really is an elegant drink. And you're gonna take your fennel vodka, you're gonna use about two ounces per drink. So for one drink, you'll use two ounces of fennel vodka, and then you're gonna use one ounce of fresh squeezed orange juice and a little dash of bitters. Shake it all up and you are good to go. What was fascinating was when you poured it out, uh, I could actually see the fennel in there. I could see some of the, 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 the bits of the herbs. And to me, that's kind of cool because that's kind of like, that's kind of a new form of a, of a, of a dirty martini. Yeah, it is. You're a good point. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of uh, popularity right now with herbs and drinks. So I think it's very timely. Um, and as I said, it's getting your, your taste buds ready to taste something amazing and wonderful, some yummy food that you've made. This is an elegant drink to serve as a cocktail aperitif prior to your meal. You could drink this afterwards too, though. Oh, you could. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We like to drink a lot of uh, drinks after the meal as a dessert, you know, so this would fit the bill with that too because it's got that nice licorice flavor. And I left the fennel fronds in. You could take them out, but I kind of like the bits of fronds floating around like that. It gives a little extra herbaceousness to it. And it, it just takes a little time to prepare. You don't have to do much, but you just have to prepare about a week ahead of time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We just need to prepare your vodka fennel, and then they're the ones that really have to do all the work. Once you're done mixing it together, you put it in the fridge and you forget it, and then when you're ready to mix your uh, martini up, your fennel martini, basically you just put them all together, and that takes about two minutes. Perfect. That is a fennel martini. Enjoy, everybody. Go out and try it for yourself. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. The Euro US Cup is over, and the Euros won pretty handily. Yeah, it was a tough loss, but at the same time, too, I actually have a little bit of a tribute to this event that not only did I get to play in, but I also got to document as well. The best cup is uh, always this one and the next one. And that's what makes the Euro US Cup, with all due respect, more prestigious than the Ryder Cup. The evidence is clear to your intrepid golf correspondent. The U.S. Euro Cup requires 16 points, not 14 to win it. Only eight guys, not 12 guys. It covers five days, not three. We play courses with no practice rounds. Think Rory or Ricky would do that? And we played in horrible conditions. Think Florida monsoons are bad? How about playing the Arctic Circle teeing off after midnight? Yep, Euro U.S. Cup has done that. Could the pampered pussies on the PGA put up with that? If you think so, I got your fjord right here. Good match. Yes. Good match. And since European football is the 21st century game, the so, Euro-US Cup I bears the same tradition now. Right, and so how about more fashion? Sure, Ian Poulter is considered flamboyant, but he couldn't hold a flame to these guys competing for the Cato Award. And they play in these digs. And would the Ryder Cup hey, dare part offer part a pitiful award doors. given to the person who has the worst sob story for a lousy round of golf? No coddling here. And sure, Jim Furyk has a weird loop in his swing, but can Jimmy do this? A perfect toe loop swing, landing a shot on the 17th at Sawgrass for a birdie. If he did, Fluff's mustache would disappear. And speaking of talent, can anyone on the Ryder Cup team perform like this during the event? That's right, all at once dreading the shank and slice while channeling Satchmo and Diamond. Who needs one swing ball? That's what I thought. And what Ryder Cup captain would allow this? No, the verdict is in. The Euro US Cup is more prestigious and stranger than the Ryder Cup.
Well, a little tongue-in-cheek, and certainly no disrespect to the Ryder Cup. In fact, we would love to cover the Ryder Cup, too, right here on Undercover Jet Set. Exactly. Well, and I think, you know, we showed you how you could create your own event. Just go to Jet Setter Deals. They'll help you with everything. It's easy, inexpensive, and they'll take care of you for any of your travel needs. And uh, you may want us to come along, too. So if you do, let us know. Cheers. Cheers.